How's it going, everyone? Welcome to this week's Q&A. So like any other week, if you want a chance to win your questions being answered, make sure you drop a comment down below. Now, I'm a little bit congested this week, but uh, I'm going to get through the video regardless. So if I sound a little bit off, uh, that is why. But anyways, that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the first question of the week. And it is um, when changing the spool valve or the VCM solenoid on the J series with the VCM, uh, what do we usually do? Is there some mileage and stuff like that? So there's really no mileage. That you should be you know changing this just because now a good rule of thumb is just every time you change your oil take a peek down a layer and just make sure uh, everything is nice and dry now the vcm solenoid or the spool valve sits just above the alternator and that's the key factor is protecting that alternator uh, you don't want to get to the point where it is leaking drenching that alternator and now you have to replace the vcm solenoid and the alternator so a lot of times people go to three four alternators before uh, coming to us and said hey my alternator keeps burning out i don't know why uh, yada 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 and whatever so um you know right around maybe 60 70 000 miles or so five years old start taking a look down in there and if you start seeing some sweating at that point you know see if you want to go ahead just keep an eye on it or if it's leaking you bought a car used i change it immediately especially if you start noting some stains on the uh alternator itself so uh what do we do do we replace the whole solenoid or do we do just the gasket? So Honda only sells everything here as an assembly. And as you can see here, I have an old piece and a new piece. And uh, this week, luckily enough, I was able to do one of these. Now, I recommend it both ways. And um, first way is replacing this whole assembly. Unfortunately, the whole rock arm assembly has to come out for that. And then you got to do a valve adjustment and uh, things of that nature, which isn't a bad idea because typically these do fail, uh, you know, later on in a vehicle's life. So um that's obviously going to be a lot more expensive than just going ahead and getting this honda only sells this like this so not sure why they won't sell just the um you know the gaskets or whatever um but this is how they sell so this is how we get it i've also replaced them with aftermarket ones as per customer's request and nine out of ten times they end up leaking so uh now we just get this and we recommend replacing just the solenoids and i put the uh the o-rings or gas excuse me and I always put the new solenoid body on there. Uh, this one doesn't really do much, but this one is the important thing. You also have to uh, uh, seal this with uh, some Honda Bond if replacing the whole thing. So uh, typically the customer will go for this option because it's a lot labor, a lot less labor intensive. Uh, you get the new solenoid anyways up top with the two new gaskets. So you uh, choose to do it this way. You have three tens uh, right over here. I have a full video on how to do this. I'll link in the description section down below. So you split this apart just like this. And now we have uh, one gasket right over here. You can see that. So that'll come usually on the new valve and it stays with it. If it separates, just put it back in there. No big deal. You have two dial pins, one here, one stayed on the other end, which typically happens as well. And then you have this plate over here. So you take off this plate. You know, you can only put it on one way. You have two holes here, two holes there. If you put it on backwards, it's not going to go on. And then you have your second gasket here. And this one is actually a perfect example because it's super flat. And as I took it off, it split right over here. So that's typically 99% uh, of the way people go ahead and try to do this. Uh, again, I offer it both ways, both options, and everyone's always going to go for the cheaper option. Um, it's a significantly amount cheaper because uh, if you do it that way, it's like a 30 minute job. Uh, with cleaning and everything if you do it the other way you're talking three four five hours or so uh, you have to let the engine cool off so you can do the valve adjustment properly so um obviously people again are going to go for the cheaper option so uh, that would be my recommendation if you want to try those aftermarket gaskets go right ahead if you have one that i've used before and you had good luck with it and it's been more than like 100 miles you know a couple thousand miles a couple of ten thousand miles and it's still not leaking uh you know let us know what gasket or brand you use and like that, we could all have the most updated information. So hopefully answers a question for you. All right, so the next question, I keep getting it over and over and over. And a couple of guys are typically in the TLX uh, guys are running into these issues and uh, intercooler couplers are popping off. So this is happening after they install aftermarket uh, intercoolers with, um, you know, charge piping and couplers uh, and stuff like that. So uh, number one issue that's happening is uh, people are just not making the clamps tight enough. Now these do come with warm clamps and they work fine. T-bolt clamps are not needed for an application like this. And most of the kits out there have warm clamps. So if you have tightened them correctly, and I mean run them all the way down with a quarter inch ratchet and give it your best shot at the end, and this should be good enough. If it's popping off, the uh, second uh, best solution after that would be 
using hairspray. Now, yes, hairspray, go to your mom's uh, you know, bathroom, go to your grandma's bathroom, go to your wife's bathroom, your girlfriend, whatever, grab the hairspray, take some of that hairspray, spread it around on a coupler, and this is gonna do two things. One, it's gonna act as a lubricant when you install it, and two, after it's installed, it's going to create a sticky tacky kind of situation um, you know, almost acting like a glue. Now, it's not going to go on there permanently. It's just going to be tacky enough to where it uh, should stay on there. And the, the um, clamp uh, placement is also uh, very crucial. You don't want to put it at the tip. You want to make sure that it's catching that bead or that end of the pipe so it doesn't slip off. Now, I've done this method on probably 30 of these cars already. I have yet to have one intercooler uh, piping pop off. It can happen, but I'm hearing it over and over again. That guys are having constant issues with this. So uh, that would be my recommendations. I do it just because I don't want to have the uh, headache. Uh, a lot of people come far away. A lot of times it's the one behind a bumper. So if it happens to you, it's not a quick fix uh, nine out of 10 times. Sometimes it'll be at the throttle body, but in most situations it won't be. And obviously if you're out in the middle of the road, uh, now you got to get, get, uh, get the car towed. Uh, maybe it's in the middle of the night, uh, very inconvenient, stuff like that. So um, that would be my recommendation. Uh, again, I haven't had any issues. I've been installed probably close to 30 of these kits already at this time. So hopefully that answers this question for you. All right, so the next question is uh, alternator. Is there a specific time that you should be changed? And one the simple answer is no. Some of these alternators will go two, 300,000 miles. Now, uh, if you want to go ahead and change it uh, for whatever reason, you could go right ahead. The only time I would recommend changing it just because would be A, if it's saturated in oil from like a VCM a type of oil leak, for instance. Uh, B, if it has some sort of a whiny or growling type of sound, that means the bearings inside are, are compromised uh, in some way, short, uh, you know, shape or form. And at some point it's going to give out. Or uh, C, if it's not charging, obviously, uh, number three there, you wouldn't want uh, to go ahead and drive a car. You're gonna get stuck. So if it's not charging, uh, time to change it. If there's oil leak on it, um, time to change it or if there's some type of external noise, then it's time to change it as well. Outside of that, even if the car has 200, 300,000 miles, I personally want to change it. Now, these alternators are typically very, very good unless if there's some outside influence once again. Um, but, you know, if you, you know, have uh, no reason to change it, then I wouldn't change it. Um, you know, they could go again, two, 300,000 miles. Sometimes we rarely see them failing early on, and typically it's because of a noise or something like that. Um, so in the shop, what we see is noise uh, with them and uh, failed because of some sort of uh, oil leak. It's usually on the J-Series, again, with the VCM uh, sound noise. So hopefully that's a question for you. So the next question, uh, 2.0 hybrid versus the 2.0T, uh, what is the best option here? So if you saw my recent reel, uh, that is our third, I believe, CRV hybrid that we have seen come in with the failed head gasket. Now the good news is, if there is one here, is that they're typically well over 100,000 miles. So if you compare it to an engine back in the day, you would say, well, some of these engines went two, three, four hundred thousand miles without needing any major, uh, you know, repairs like a head gasket or something like that. And uh, you'd be correct. Unfortunately, uh, with modern day tech and uh, regulations and stuff like that, these manufacturers are pushed to uh, push things to the limit, essentially. So we have very, very high compression on these Atkinson engines. And on the turbo side of things, we have a lot of pressure and stuff uh, going on in there from the turbocharger itself. So um, it's hard to say which one to choose. We've also seen a surge and 2.0 T head gasket failure. So uh, it's kind of pick your poison here. Uh, obviously, the 2.0 T's are going to start getting phased out here as uh, the hybrid tech kind of, uh, you know, starts propelling forward. Uh, we're going to see a lot more hybrid engines, uh, uh, I believe, in a lot more applications. I still think they should put one in the HRV. Um, it'll make that car pretty incredible. Now, uh, some of these and most of these uh, are neglected, uh, whether or not that could be a key factor. Uh, if you neglect like an old, um, you know, R18 port injection, you're not going to have head gasket failures. And on these newer cars, we are seeing that, unfortunately. So uh, it just it is what it is. Um, I can't say which one for you guys to choose or not. I would still probably choose uh, the hybrid for overall, um, you know, everyday consumer. You're going to have better gas mileage. And I think it'll still fare out better than a turbocharged engine. But again, uh, really depends on the maintenance and the driver and stuff like that. So it's a tough uh, question to answer. Unfortunately, we're seeing head gasket surges on both sides of them. So uh, we'll kind of have to keep an eye on this thing. Uh, the uh, underlining here, good news is that um, they seem to be faring better than the 1.5T still. I know we talk about this all the time. 
but we see constant 2.5, uh, 1.5 T's in the shop all the time. A lot of times uh, under 70, 60,000 miles or so with felt head gaskets. So if you tell me to choose uh, between uh, 60 or 70,000 miles or 150,000, then obviously uh, the hybrid lasted two times as long as the 1.5 T. And the 2.0 T's is kind of the same thing. We're usually seeing them uh, failing at a little bit higher mileage than the 1.5 T. So uh, hopefully that answers this question for you. All right, last but not least question of the week. And once again, if you want a chance to any questions being answered, make sure you drop a comment down below. So uh, the question is, uh, what are my thoughts on the J series uh, broad bearing investigation? So 1.4 more uh, additional vehicles are being investigated. Now, uh, 249,000 vehicles were recalled back in November, 2023. And uh, we are underway with those recalls. I've done a couple of them. I believe all of them have been pilots. And all of mine have been just rod bearings so far. Uh, the guy that works next to me actually ended uh, needing a, a short block replacement. So we went ahead and did that. Now, we do not make the call on what gets what. Sometimes uh, we're like, wow, that looks incredibly uh, bad. The bearings look really bad shape. And Honda wants to do just bearings. Sometimes the bearings look pretty clean and they want to throw a crank in it or a uh, block in it or whatnot. So we do not get to say what we put in there. That comes strictly from Honda Engineering. They tell us what to put in there. They send us the file. Uh, we make zero calls on that. It's a pretty uh, you know, strict um, guidelines that they have. Again, uh, my opinion doesn't matter on what I see. It's what they see and what they want to do. So you can't tell your technician or your dealer, like, hey, man, I know it just needs bearings. Put a short block in it. That's not how it works. Uh, again, we don't make the call, and uh, that's just 100% on them. But anyway, so... Um, 1.4 million vehicles are being investigated at this time. 18 to 20 TLX, 16 to 20 MDX, 16 to 20 Pilot, 18 to 20 Odyssey, and 17 to 19 Ridgeline. Now, obviously, the TLX is just the ones with the J series, not the ones with the K24. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure what's going to be made out of this. If we have to go and inspect 1.4 million vehicles, that is going to be uh, absolutely. A uh, horrible situation for the technicians and for the dealers. Obviously, everyone's going to want to, or most people are going to want to have their vehicle investigated uh, immediately. Now, there has been 400 reports of this um, being felt outside of that uh, VIN range, I guess, initial VIN range. That's why uh, they're investigating more vehicles at this time. And I believe there was like uh, seven incidences where the car shut off and may have caused some sort of a crash or a fire or something like that. So obviously, it could be very serious. Uh, I think those vehicles most likely had a noise already and maybe people ignored them or not. The, the engine isn't just going to seize on it. It's going to give you some sort of indication. It's going to knock. You'll probably get an oil pressure light at that point. Uh, if you hear any sort of knocking, don't drive your vehicle. Uh, I would recommend re uh, towing it to uh, your local dealer uh, because obviously you don't want to be driving it and the engine seizes uh, midway there or whatnot. So that would be my recommendation. But, uh, you know, everyone is, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want to do at that point, but if you hear an engine knocking uh, and your vehicle falls in one of those, um, you know, in the range, then uh, I would take it there, even though uh, there hasn't been a recall yet. But if you have any of those that I mentioned, uh, that would be what I would do. But again, you could do as you uh, please. So uh, if this ends up being just an investigation, let's say only 10% of them need uh, engine block replacement, it's still going to be a huge recall. So uh, if this does get implemented into where we have to actually recall 1.4 million vehicles, uh, be patient. Uh, I know everyone's going to want to go ahead and get their cars inspected. I have one of the cars potentially affected as well. My car's been great. I don't hear any noises. But, um, you know, we're not going to get to say uh, what happened. I, you know, it's so, so many cars that I'm sure there's going to be people trying to jump the line and stuff like that. And Honda will probably prioritize the vehicles that are either A, down or B, have a knocking situation over the cars that maybe are driving fine. Again, I'm not sure, I can't speak on their behalf. Uh, this is just from previous experiences of what may or may not happen. So again, uh, 1.4 million vehicles is a ton of vehicles for a major engine type of uh, investigation and inspection recall. Uh, but maybe only half of that will be actually recalled. Uh, we're not sure just yet. Maybe they have a way of identifying what exactly happened at what point and uh, what uh, you know gives it the yay and the nay. Uh, I guess we'll have to you know let it play out and kind of see how things uh, roll down uh, the, the street here a little bit. But um, only time will tell. Hopefully we have an answer uh, sooner rather than later. But if your vehicle ends up being one of these, please be patient with your advisors. Please be patient with your technicians. Uh, this is not a job you want to rush. Uh, we're going into the engine. 
we're dealing with uh, stuff and bearings that have to be placed strategically in each um, you know connecting rod and stuff like that uh, if you put a bearing in the wrong place if you don't torque something correctly if you have a, a little piece of lint in the bearing uh, it could go south real quick so uh, I know it's frustrating for uh, you guys as a consumer but it's definitely uh, frustrating for us uh, technicians as well uh, and sometimes advisors will try to push us too and I tell them listen this isn't the job uh, this has to be done uh, it's not something that we're going to push and certainly not something I'm going to rush because you need to meet uh, some sort of a deadline or something. So uh, hopefully that answers this question for you and I'll catch everyone on the next one.